really extraordinary guest with us, uh, Dr. Sidney Baker and Dr. William Shaw. Uh, gentlemen, it's an honor. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both of you for joining us today. You're welcome. So, so first off, on, on behalf of the autism community, I would really like to start by saying thank you uh, both uh, so very much for all the work that you have done and continue to do for people with, with autism and for their families. Uh, I know there's been thousands and thousands of families that have greatly benefited from your work. Uh, so we're incredibly appreciative of uh, what you do and, um, and also super excited that you have agreed to doing this interview with us. Um, so, so both Dr. Bakers and, and Show have, uh, Baker and Show have uh, very, very impressive backgrounds and very extensive backgrounds, um, which it, it could take you know, a while to go over. So, uh, you know, we're going to leave a couple of links actually in the introduction to this video so people can, you know, look at their backgrounds in detail. Uh, but just as a quick summary, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, introduce the, this gentleman. Uh, Dr. Sidney Baker was the co-founder of Defeat Autism Now, uh, which is a national organization devoted to promoting meaningful dialogue among parents, practitioners, and scientists uh, regarding biomedical treatment options and the environmental origins of the current uh, autism epidemic. Uh, he received his undergrad medical and medical postgraduate training from Yale University, uh, where he served as chief resident in pediatrics on the full-time uh, medical faculty. He is the author of multiple books and publications um, and was the 1999 recipient of the Linus uh, Pauling Award of the Institute for Functional Medicine uh, for his contributions to the development of functional medicine. Uh, just to name, you know, one of many achievements. He is the founder of Autism360.org and chief vision officer uh, and founder of Medigenesis. Uh, as a doctor, he has a great interest, as he has demonstrated throughout the years, in nutritional, biochemical, and uh, environmental aspects of chronic illness in adults uh, and, and children. And through Autism360, he is dedicated to empowering families caught in the in this rise in in, in incidence of autism by developing actionable clinical uh, treatment options. Um, Dr. William Shaw, he is a board certified in, in the fields of clinical chemistry and toxicology by the American Board of Clinical Chemistry and is the founder of the Great Plains Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Shaw worked uh, for the Center uh, for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC here in the United States, uh, the Children's Mercy Hospital, uh, the University of Missouri at Kansas City uh, School of Medicine, and Smith, uh, Smith Klein Laboratories. Uh, he is the author of Biologi Biological Treatment, uh, Treatments for Autism and PDD, uh, originally published in 1998, and Autism Beyond the Basics, published in 2009. Uh, Dr. Shaw is the stepfather of a child with autism and has helped thousands of um, you know, families in, you know, and, and medical practitioners uh, to successfully improve the lives of people with autism, ADHD, Alzheimer's disease, and, and other serious conditions. Um, so in today's interview, we are going to discuss uh, Dr. Baker and Shaw's uh, latest publication. The title of the manuscript is Rapid Complete Recovery from Autism After Treatment of Aspergillus with Antifungal Drugs, Itraconosal, and Espranox. So that's, that's, a, that's an amazing title uh, to begin with. And the last thing I, I would like to say before we start is we did receive many, many questions uh, from parents, researchers, and, and fellow doctors, actually, uh, which you know I have done my best to consolidate and, and that I'll be using as the basis uh, for this interview. So it is possible that if you have some questions along the way uh, in the interview, you know, you know, feel free to post them, post them in the comment section and, and we'll, you know, we'll fill them to, uh, to this gentleman along the way. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Baker, let, let, me, let me start with you. I mean, for those who, who haven't uh, had the chance to read the publication yet, uh, which, by the way, we're providing a link in the, you know, to the manuscript in the post uh, of, of this uh, video. Uh, would you please walk us through the study, uh, the, the case uh, that, that, that you guys uh, researched and, you know, what were the specifics of the case and the treatment plan and the results that you observed? I'd like to walk us uh, down a path that will lead to what you're talking about, but I'd like to uh, open it up with a way of uh, describing a little bit of the background that I bring to this uh, task. Uh, and I'm going to read it to, so that I don't get lost uh, on my own, or listening to my own voice. Uh, I left a full-time appointment in pediatrics, obstetrics, and computer science 
to be a family doctor in a new prepaid health plan in New Haven. This was years ago. The plan had contracted with a residential center for severely handicapped children and adults, annual physical exams, and overall medical assessment was part of what I did during my half day in the center every two weeks. A handsome nonverbal teenage boy sat on the end of an exam table and I, and I began my routine with an ophthalmoscope <clears throat> to look at and into his eye. As I did, he hauled off and hit me right between my eyes. I had not removed my glasses, but his fist did the job, <laughs> sending them to the floor in two pieces. <laughs> I was stunned in both ways <laughs> of thinking about being stunned. And on reflection, I thought that what his fist was saying to me was, you were looking into me, but you are not seeing me. That was my introduction to autism, which has been on my mind ever since. I'd like to switch over to another introductory expression of my interest, which began with Dr. Bernard Rimland, who came to Yale to give a talk at the Yale Child Study Center which had in recent years changed leadership from Dr. Arnold Cassell, a pioneer in the study of child development, to a faculty that was focused on child psychiatry. Dr. Rimland had established centers for the study of child development in California, one sort of on the clinical side and one on the side of research. The Autism Research Institute, with a focus on the biology of autism, which he, the father of an autistic child, understood to be not a psychosocial cause, that is cold mothers, but one of biologic toxic causation, which, for which immunization meant part of the toxicity story. The applause at the end of Dr. Rimland's talk at Yale was tepid and came with rolling eyeballs. I, I, who was not long before chief resident and then member of the pediatrics faculty, stood up to say that in my experience, my experience brought me in line with what Dr. Rimlin was saying. That was the beginning of a deep friendship between Bernie and myself that resulted in a series of conferences the first of which was in Dallas in 1995 and brought together scholars, practitioners, parents, and other scientists, including uh, Dr. Shaw, to brainstorm the paths to understanding the situation. John Pangborn, the, the scientist father of an autistic child, and I wrote a summary of the meetings and Bernie published it. We went on to have national meetings once or twice a year. And one of them in 1996 came up in that, this was 1996 now, this is early in the game. I came up with the following poem, which may help people understand the person that Bernie Rimland was. The title of the poem is doggerel for the 1996 autism conference. Be patient, this takes about three minutes, but I think you'll enjoy it. If you don't, it's my fault. <laughs> Let's all dress up like Bern, like Brimlin PhD. I'll tell you how to look, how the look should be with ego in and out of the way and chin and neck stuck out and in the fray where he takes short-term rights or wrongs and puts aside in lieu of a long range goal, he keeps in view and ensures no opportunity is missed to stir things up and even get some folks pissed. That's why Bernie's here is just off the red eye to make sure our conversation flies. 
let him with vigor quite enormous and love and passion to inform us today and tomorrow and tonight at least get the questions right. Let us ride on River Rimland, follow Bernie's boat and him in the class four rapids of descent through the gorge of critics discontent, those who rather row a slower boat and take a safer course and float in waters deep and calm and clear, while where reflection alleviates the fear that we could round the bend and find that we're not completely double blind. Let us follow Bernard Bear and watch his motion cross states and countries, skies and oceans, a creature with enormous habitat and range, his ecologic niche is shift and change, where competition for sometimes scarce resources is provided by less progressive forces. Like some of us right here who came with doubts as to what this conference what may what may what this conference may be about, and worried that perhaps some heresies might contaminate our reputes or our CVs. Fear not, the doubters have their work cut out. Be prepared to speak, complain, and shout, and bring to bear in his direction the necessary heat of disaffection, the crucible that forges science hard and nourishes our children's friend Bernard, whose optimistic energy infects us while he continues to expect us to keep his tempo and his intense resolve to see autism's mysteries dissolve in a solvent of our collective might, or perhaps a single drop of insight distilled by someone here or somehow touched by us who have gathered here to think and to discuss how perception, memory, recognition get us so sensitive that kids condition can get off track and, and make developing so difficult for certain human beings. I did that because I wanted to give a sense of Bernie's lasting uh, endowment and leadership in our family. He was an extraordinary person and I think it serves our purpose to remind ourselves of his uh, remarkable talents uh, that uh, was part of the beginning of what we're doing today, but was in 1995 when we had that first meeting. So I'm ready for... Amen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Dr. Baker. Um, and uh, yeah, we certainly appreciate um, all the legacy from Dr. Rimland and um, so, so, so for, for those of, uh, for those people that, that are watching that haven't really had the chance to, to read the publication yet, um, and again, we're, we're providing the link to the publication for, for you know, people that, can, that, that want to read it. Uh, why don't you go ahead and work on the specific case in the study and uh, what were the specifics of the case, the treatment plan and the improvements that you observed uh, as a result of the treatment? Let me open the door for um, Bill. Uh, by introducing the little boy. Uh, this was a, a, a boy uh, who had been under my care for some months. And uh, I have a um, strong interest in the relationship between funguses and people. And uh, so I often try giving a patient with complex illness an antifungal medicine of some kind to test the water a little bit and see if we get a reaction, which is sometimes a bad reaction because when the, when the yeast or funguses die, they release the very toxins that are causing mischief. So that's a positive signal that there's something we should be doing. In this case, this little boy uh, took some Saccharomyces boulardii, a yeast that kills other yeasts. And uh, since it's since it's a yeast, it really knows how to kill the other yeast. And so you get a die-off or Herxheimer reaction with it, which is what happened to this little boy. So I said, ah, we're on the right path here. 
And we followed that path for a little while to get uh, our bearings. And then I said, okay, well, let's give him something stronger, uh, which was uh, Sporinox, Itraconazole. Top of the list of, of the, many, uh, the few antifungals that are out there. And he had, again, a very noticeable Herxheimer reaction. And that's, of course, demands making sure the kid's bowels are moving so that the traffic goes all the way through and doesn't linger with this, uh, this thing going on in the gut. And um, so I had him making sure he was pooping regularly. And then we um, saw improvement in his skills right away. And then these would come and go. And then um, to make a, the story short, after we had increased the dose of Sporinox to 600 milligrams a day, which should make everybody's eyes dilate a bit, <laughs> um, we had, and of course this was a four-year-old boy, so he was taking about 12 times the adult dose of, of sacrum, of, but we were checking his AST and ALT and his liver was happy the whole time. Then we fell into a, a period during which he, we had mysterious lapses from the improvement, which it took us a while to figure out was because he had generic itraconazole that was being rotated with the Sporinox. Once we sorted that out and had him on Sporinox by itself on, on this high dose of, of 600 milligrams a day in a four-year-old kid, he became a completely normal, smart child. And we eventually ratcheted down on this uh, in steps. We go down on the dose and then he gets symptoms come back. So then we go back up again and then down and then up and down and down and down until finally he was off the Sparnox and was a perfectly normal little genius. He was by that time ready to go to a school and he happened to be changing schools at that time. And they tested him for his behavioral and cognitive features. And he tested out as a six year old and he was only four or four and a half by that time. It was uh, therefore uh, something that was quite impressive. And along the way, um, of course, I was in touch with Bill and he can tell his part of the story. Yeah, uh, did, did you want me to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, give my findings at Great Plains now? Yeah. 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 So, 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 yeah go, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead uh, Enrique. No, no. Uh, yeah, no. So, uh, uh, yeah, you, you can you can provide some background. I mean, we're going to go into the details. Um, if if you have any any additional details uh, regarding the background, I mean, please please go ahead. So the uh, of course I at that time did not know the the uh, uh, child at all except through what uh, Dr. Baker was telling me. But the biochemical results were, were uh, very interesting because the child had high amounts of compounds that are characteristic of, um, of both uh, Candida, but also the mold Aspergillus, which is, a, which is a genus that has hundreds of different species. Um, and and uh, following the the treatment with the uh, with the Sporinox, there was a dramatic drop, like 98% drop in the uh, amount of the compounds that were from uh, Aspergillus, as well as a drop in the compound that was from uh, Candida. Uh, and and so and the important thing is I've seen this in a, you know a fairly large number of children. Uh, with uh, autism who have these uh, markers 
uh, that were elevated. So it was a very exciting uh, finding. And almost a around almost the exact same time, a scientific paper came out from Eastern Europe uh, indicating that more than 90% of children have had uh, 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 microscopic uh, yeast observed, observed under the microscope uh, in their blood. And, and more than 90% also had high antibodies to a particular strain of aspergillus, which is one of the most um, the, the, the most pathogenic, which is called aspergillus uh, fumigatus. I talked with a, 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 another clinic that served autism infant, and they had also found high uh, antibodies to this aspergillus fumigatus. It is one of the most lethal yeast. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people die uh, each year from getting this. And the most exciting thing about this was is that the mothers of these children also had the Aspergillus fumigatus, which indicated that, that uh, autism could be transmitted prenatally from, from the mother uh, uh, to, to, the, to the child. And of course, that's not the only way you can get it. Virtually every single person on earth gets hundreds of spores from this Aspergillus fumigatus just walking around in their daily routine. But if they have good immunity, then they, they, you know, they don't become infected and, 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 uh, and die from it. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the paper you're referencing, I think, is the, the paper by the Dr. Nadia Markova um, on yes, the- Yes, Markova, that's correct. Yes, on the um, connection between the, the, you know, the uh, markers in, in, and this was specifically like found in blood. So that's, that's actually very interesting. Um, so so if, if we could like start, um, you know, like going through the different layers of what you guys uh, have mentioned. Uh, first off, I mean, this seemed to be a clear case where a fungal infection, specifically a colonization by aspergillus, as, as you have mentioned, was in fact the cause of the stereotypical symptoms and behaviors of the child autism. Um, so, so clearly, no, you know, we're, we're not suggesting, uh, you know, that all, all cases of autism will be necessarily linked to, to you know, to fungal infections. Uh, but for those that are linked, like like in the in the case of of this child, right? I guess the question is. What are some of the ways in which these infections can happen? I mean, Dr. Sher, you just mentioned you just mentioned that you know it can really happen at any time, uh, frankly. Uh, but what are what are some of the ways just just so that we we're aware of of how these you know infections are um, you know transmitted and, and end up in the in the bodies of the children? Well, they uh, you know I mean the mechanism presented by Dr. Markovo was that it was it, because, I mean, it was 100% of the mothers of the children with autism who also had the, uh, uh, the uh, aspergillus in the blood. So, so her suggestion, I think, is very uh, possible that it's a, uh, the mothers are infected. And the reason the mother would be infected is, uh, it, 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 it is because of the uh, very common use of immunosuppressive drugs, the most common being things like prednisone and prednisolone. Uh, they, they're, they're commonly given for severe allergies or autoimmune disease or, you know, for many different reasons. And these, these drugs suppress the immune system, which allows the uh, virtually everyone has exposure, but they don't get it because they have good immunity. But if you are taking immunosuppressive drugs, then you, you greatly increase the chance that, that the uh, significant amounts of this uh, fungus or mold will start growing in your GI tract, in your lungs, and you know, in the worst case scenario is you know, throughout your body. So there's, like I said, hundreds of thousands of people who die from this infection. So the Aspergillus fumigatus is the most pathogenic 
of all the hundreds of species. So even though it's only a tiny portion of the uh, the spores found, like in you know floating around a typical hospital, it it is like 90% of all the infections in the hospital are from this fumigata species. Uh, and so, um, you know, so I think it's possible that this may be one of the major factors. And of course, I'm not saying the only factor because I, of course we've used every kind of factor under the, uh, there is, uh, you know, Dr. Baker and I have, have uh, talked about many different uh, 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 potential treatments and, and abnormalities in autism that can be directed, but this is a very high percentage. You know, more than uh, more than ninety uh, percent. And and I also want to say my initial study at the Children's Hospital, in which I used antifungal uh, uh, treatment, a very high percentage of these children also, had, in addition to having candida markers, also had. Uh, the the markers of the aspergillus, and so and we and and in that original study we found significant improvement. This was uh, 25 years ago. Found significant improvement uh, in in the uh, uh, children with autism who were on antifungals. The thing is, we didn't know was the was it due to treating the candida, or was it due to treating the mold? And there's there's no way of knowing because antifungal drugs affect both uh, types of uh, yeast and fungus. So, uh, so to begin with, uh, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on on candida, but in retrospect, uh, the you know the probably hundreds of thousands of children with autism who have done antifungals, it they're imp and commonly improved may be due to uh, the, the, uh, the treatment of the aspergillus versus the candida, or perhaps both combined. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, I guess if it, if it can be communicated through in, in pregnancy, then I think it is conceivable that also it could be passed through the breast milk, for example, right? Yes. Uh, or, or it could be, you know, obviously airborne or, you know, maybe in the food or, you know, maybe, you know, different, you know, sources for that. Uh, so, so one thing that, that caught my attention is that you specifically for this publication, you used the, an organic acid test, uh, yes. which, is a, which is a urine test, right? Yes. Uh, to, to detect this aspergillus marker. So, so this may be a question for, for you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, many people are wondering if, if you would recommend an organic acid test, in, in, you know, in general, right, to confirm a, a case of a fungal infection by aspergillus, or or do some people need, you know, for some other reason, uh, something more specific, like a mycotoxins uh, test, so or, I, or I maybe something else. I recommend both because the organic acid test, you know, mainly picks up. Uh, aspergillus, but there are many species that may be omitted, like penicillium or stachybotrys. Or so, I, I think it's very worthwhile doing both. the The benefit of the organic acid test is if you have positive results for aspergillus on this test, it it means that the person has a gastrointestinal uh, colonization. And the reason it means that is because in our original studies, when we put children on nystatin, these markers of the aspergillus consistently went lower. And nystatin is not a drug that, that gets into the body. It's, it only affects organisms in the GI tract. So the, so the fact that, that these organisms are, uh, the fact that, um, uh, these values went down indicates that the that uh, under the influence of nystatin means uh, that these necessarily are, have a GI colonization. GI meaning gastrointestinal for those who aren't familiar with the, yep uh, with the term. So is I think all this was extremely exciting, and there was you know it's just as coincidence we had started doing the 
mycotoxin test about the same time and, and, and saw that the, the children with autism had uh, uh, elevated uh, mycotoxins as well as the uh, aspergillus markers on the uh, organic acid test. And since then, we've launched a research study, which is now full, and which you know we're we're testing all of the the families for uh, the presence of uh, Aspergillus fumigatus antibodies. We're we're doing the organic acids, and we're doing the mycotoxins as well as some uh, other tests. And you know we're 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 just now in the middle of it but we're not now accepting any uh, more uh, candidates into the uh, research study. Yeah, now, now that we're in the topic of, of the infection in the gut, right? Uh, so that the, the Jesus mentioned, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know if you're aware of, of the research uh, by Dr. James Adams and his team at the Arizona State University. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know Jim very well and have looked at his publications, yes. So, so, the, so they they reported something interesting, which I think is is kind of related to what we're discussing right now. I mean, so so they reported in one of his studies that children on the autism spectrum have about twenty five percent fewer species of bacteria in their gut yeah. compared to healthy kids. So, so I guess the, the question is, can these fungal infections uh, explain the dysbiosis? Um, you know, or in other words, could fungi prevent beneficial bacteria from colonizing the gut effectively? Yeah, uh, yeah. So definitely. So so um, the, the products of many of these fun, uh, fungi are antibiotics. So the, the most common antibiotic there is, is uh, penicillin, which is, which is from a mold, a penicillium uh, mold. So a high number of these different uh, molds and, and fungi produce uh, antibiotics that 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 are killing uh, various uh, bacteria. Yep. So so yeah, you know, I guess I guess the, the the next question would be: Is it possible that uh, like the the treatment that you know Dr. Adams conducted, like the microbiota transfer therapy or fecal fecal matter transplants, uh, could help with these these viruses, In your opinion? Uh, it 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 could, but I I think the uh, the antifungal drugs are. Uh, is more simple and less less messy and, and probably mm. a lot a, a, a lot less expensive than yeah. the, than the fecal transplant. <laughs> less messy for sure, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so so before we move on to talk about the the actual treatment, uh, th there seems to be a, a foundational element to these kinds of opportunistic infections, um, if you will. So, I mean, children on the autism spectrum just seem to have many kinds of susceptibilities, right? Uh, you know, either to the environment or to chemicals or to toxins or to, you know, many different susceptibilities. So, uh, you know, one of the common questions we received is, is to what extent do you consider um, the genetics of the child or their immune system before initiating a treatment like this? Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, Dr. Baker can answer that, but I, I, I doubt that there was any consideration of uh, 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 genetics in deciding to, uh, to uh, treat. So on my side, I view the initial treatment with say Saccharomyces boulardii as a test um, is then convertible into a treatment. But when you see a response, you, you know you're in the right ballpark. And then it's just a question of what kind of ball you want to play. It, it may be that there are other antifungals that are as effective uh, as uh, is uh, Sporinox, but I think in general, uh, Sporinox has the advantage if it's brand name. Now, there are some generic etriconazoles in the United States which are perfectly good. The question is, you don't know if it is when you buy it at the pharmacy. And um, 
So this has been a very troublesome part of this whole thing because uh, as you may know, uh, Sporanos is extremely expensive. Uh, why the uh, company that makes it should have it that way is beyond me. I haven't been able to contact them to figure it out because they're just completely mm, locked off from, from any efforts for me to get at them. But in the United States, if, if, if a Sporanox that's made in the United States is $500 for about 30 pills. Well, in Canada, it's about $180 for 30 pills. And if you get it from the, the same company, the same laboratory from made in Turkey or India, it's like, uh, you know, $80 for 30 pills. It's it's completely different landscape. So you have to have- a, oh, is, So a, it might be cheaper to fly to India and stock up? <laughs> yeah, it would be. I haven't done that yet because I have a pharmacy in Canada who helps me with this whole thing. Yeah, so, so some people are wondering about the, the rapid recovery part of the of the of the publication, right? Uh, and and especially since this was a pretty severe case, it sounds like, right? Um, so so they are asking whether there was anything else that was either done in preparation for the treatment or anything else besides the the itraconazole and eventually Spornox uh, treatment that could have helped this child to achieve these kinds of rapid uh, results. So, you know, was he on a particular diet during the treatment? Did, did he do a, a gut cleanse or was, were there any supplements or medications in preparation for the treatment? Well, he was already on a diet without sugar, of course, and uh, gluten-free, casein-free, but that's the rule for all of my kids in the spectrum. But I think your question is a good one because I've got a good answer. During the time of this trial, the only variable that was changed was this high dose of, of Sporanox. And when he got better, and we, as I said before, he, we ratcheted down step by step, and then he'd get symptoms back, we'd go up again, and we'd go down and up and down and up and down. This is over a few months period. But when he got to the point of zero, he got to keep his winnings and he hasn't had any antifungal since then. And he's this remarkably brilliant, talented little boy mm -hmm. with no traces at all of a long list. And the list is in, in the paper that we published because as you, well, you don't know, but I, I'm quite obsessed with the idea that labels on children don't count. It's the details that count, the symptoms are what we need to think about when we're going after a, a, um, a, a complicated kid. But if you look in the paper, you see all of his symptoms and what a mess he was as a child. Uh, with, what he, but of course, some strengths in there, which are always important. Children always have something they're good at. And of course, doctors never ask them that. The, the kid may be sitting there with his parents in the doctor's office and they hear all these things that are wrong with them and they never say anything, what is he good at? But strengths are what leverage is healing and he had some of those. But uh, what, what he, what he, what he took, did was he took a ton of Sporanox and he got cured. And that's, an, that's a good thing to have <laughs> in, the, in our game. Yeah, yeah, and, and I guess ju just to reiterate what you said, which is, which is really, really important, uh, you know, you went from from having a low dose of of itraconazole to a high dose of of spironox. So you know whether or not so so whether it was the the high dose or the change from the generic to the branded. I mean, it seems like um, you know for sure what we know is that is that the high dose of spironox definitely was was the one that was beneficial for for the child. Yeah, what was happening is that he had a prescription for the spironox, which was terribly expensive. And then he, but they had that covered, um, and um, I got, I won't reveal exactly uh, how it all worked, but they got some Sporanox, and then, but then it turned out they 
they couldn't do it all with that, so they got some some brand uh, some generic. And this was mixed in. On one week he was on this, and the other week he was on that. And this is what made everything terribly confusing because he had these good weeks and these bad weeks, and we couldn't figure out what the variable was. Of course, as eventually we figured out when he was on the brand name, Sporanoxy was great. And when he was on the Itraconazole uh, generic, he was a mess. Now, it may have been if he'd gone to a different pharmacy, he might have gotten the, some, some Itraconazole that was good stuff, but you can't figure that out. I said, it was just, I went crazy trying to figure you know, how to get around this. Uh, and so now I have a source in Canada. But I think that the, the, the answer to your question, your good question is, is easy, that we were sure once we got into it and understood the, the sources of, of the uh, Spironox versus Itraconazole, that that was it. And the only thing that we were doing that was different, uh, that we weren't, I mean, we were doing already diet and these other things ahead of time. But once we got into this zone, it was a very pure um, uh, pro uh, project in the sense of your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it, and uh, my understanding is that Spornox comes in 100 milligrams uh, yeah. capsules, if, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Uh, yeah, so it, would it be okay to simply use these 100 milligram caps or, or you know, is there, is there a need for a compounded preparation uh, to achieve the 600 milligram? No, just, just the, the, the uh, 100, 100 milligram capsules. So how many, how many people with autism uh, have you uh, treated, Dr. Baker, so far with this protocol? Well, um, in the range of... somewhere between 50 and 100 in there. And, um, and the response rate is, um, in terms of getting a real turnaround, is, let's put it this way, good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the good thing is, you know pretty quickly whether you're, you're on board. And now, what I did with this boy was to go up slowly. But then after that, I had now would go up quickly. I get on 600 milligrams within a maybe three to four week period mm -hmm. and make sure the AST and the ALT reveal a happy liver. Mm -hmm. And then once I've gotten the response, the response is very quick so that you don't, the, the, the way of doing it this way is you get the, the dangerous stuff over quickly. Now, I've had only two patients out of a hundred anyway, who had a, a rise in AST and ALT on Sporanox. It's amazingly uh, benign in that, in that perspective, from that perspective. So, but now I go up quickly over a couple of weeks time. And, um, and then, you, then you know whether you're on board mm -hmm. and then you can go down slowly once you know that you've established a, a good beachhead. Yeah, yeah. So some people were actually wondering if, if you know, going increasing, in, increasing, increasing the doses could have a could have a counterproductive effect, right? I mean, because of the nature of how sometimes uh, fungal infections work. But it sounds like you know, actually going a uh, little by little was was helpful for for this specific case. I know when I was at the children's hospital. Uh, you know, the, the kinds of drugs used there were all computerized and, and for almost all the antifungal drugs, uh, they would say many times you have to increase the dosage. So, so it was common to see recommendations for going five times the, you know, the, the, the starting dose that would, most people would get that they, they would indicate that sometimes the, the organism is more resistant. You have to go to much higher uh, doses. And I will say, almost surely, this is the reason why more children haven't recovered is that, I mean, I had the same experience in Kansas City, except I, I, I had come across a child and I talked to the mother. The child had the, 
the fungal uh, aspergillus metabolites that were a hundred times the upper limit of normal, but the local physician would not would would only give nystatin because of fear of medical boards. They mm -hmm. were strongly, you know, they were they were scared that if they did this, that the medical board was going to crack down and and uh, and uh, penalize and discipline them, and and so. I'm convinced that child did not recover because, because of, I mean, the physician is not as brave as, as Dr. Baker was. Yep. I, 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 I agree with that. I was, that was my, my assessment. Uh, you know, as soon as I read the publication, I mean, it really was a, you know, you know, very significant dose. Uh, and, and, and I guess the, the question is, is to, to these other cases that you have uh, treated Dr. Baker, uh, you know, have you varied the dosage depending on the weight, or have you always used the 600 milligrams per day dose? I, I go with the 600. I go up, go up fast, and then I, I can count my uh, the, the effect very quickly. So that the exposure to, I mean, if you think that these uh, azoles are, are that bad, and they're, they're, that's amazing to me how well, how well tolerated they are. But if you're worried about toxicity, you're going to get that, and get it, you get it quickly. But basically, I, I follow the AST and the ALT, and bingo, everybody gets up to their high doses, and then you can you can vote on whether it's a you know thumbs thumbs up or thumbs down. Yeah. Can, so, can so, you can you just address for a minute uh, AST and ALT for the you know, the non-medical people who may be attending here? Dr. Baker. Oh, well, uh, they have uh, typically in, in our profession a, a misnomer. They're called liver function tests. And they really uh, are um, tests in the blood that show you that your liver is unhappy. Um, and so that they are, uh, uh, chemicals that are part of the liver's work. And if the, your liver gets unhappy, the level in the blood goes up. So there are very good tests. If you're, a lot of drugs have, uh, uh, get an unhappy liver. And it's very, it's handy to have a simple blood test that will indicate whether you're running into trouble. So that's something that's routine with this whole deal. But as I said before, I'm, I'm amazed at how uh, infrequent the uh, high AST and ALT are. Mm. So it's it's a it's a it's a. I mean, after all, if you're a doctor, you don't want to do harm, and um, so it's good to have things that are that are unlikely to cause harm. And this one is a good example of that. Well. Um, so, so it sounds like you would you would use the same dose regardless of you know whether the child is is four years old or whether the you know the person is thirty years old, um, and, and also like the the adverse reactions to the protocol as of yet uh, have been minimal. Uh, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, I guess that the question is is the period of time, right? Um, so, have you come up with a recommended you know uh, time frame or you know period you know that people should stick to this regimen? Well, not really. I just say, I mean, it, it is a little crazy that a four-year-old gets 600 milligrams and a 40-year-old gets 600 milligrams. But there is something about Sporanox in the literature which does describe very high doses in use. It's not like I didn't invent high doses of Sporanox. But uh, I think that the, the consensus in the literature is that 600 is kind of the, the ceiling for anybody. It's, it doesn't make sense because of, after all, a 40 pound kid versus a 140 pound kid, it should be go by weight. But you want to get the best, the best leverage as possible. And that's, I think, achieved by the 600 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I just want to to point out something which is the uh, this particular drug 
is strongly recommended by the Academy for uh, uh, of um, uh, you know infectious disease physicians. Uh, uh, Sporinox is is one of the most commonly recommended, and then there's there's another drug, voriconazole, that's even more expensive. That's sometimes uh, recommended if the Sporinox is not doing the trick. They, they go to the voriconazole. So these are, you know, extremely uh, recommended by the infectious disease experts. Comes to the local physicians, they're they're you know they're they're as soon as they hear the word liver function, they freak out. I I mean I've had that experience so many times. I mean it's about eighty percent of the time when when a, a a physician hears those words, their mind is shut. You know a a uh, a steel ramp goes across <laughs> the brain that says count me out of this, Buster. <laughs> so so I guess I guess the question is what would happen, right? If if the liver markers went out of control, right? So so would you discontinue treatment? Would you take a break until the liver markers go back to normal and then resume? Or or would you preemptively use some kind of liver support or supplement to avoid these you know high liver markers in the first place? This hasn't happened to me enough to to, to even if I had an answer to to credit my answer because uh, first of all, although I know that there are um, supplements that are used to protect the liver, but I haven't, I must say I haven't used them because I haven't really needed to. If somebody's AST and ALT are start to go up, I have one adult patient now who is going up a little bit and I want to get through the test done before abandoning the effort. Because after all, the AST and ALT under 100 can look scary if you're looking for 25 or 35 as, a, as a, what it says on the, the lab report. But really when, you, when, you're in, when you're in real trouble with your liver, that's a thousand. So it's uh, AST and ALT of 100 something is tolerable up, up to a point. But as I say, I've had so little uh, experience with this that I have no expertise in the sense of uh, uh, what can you get away with and, and get a good result. So in, in your experience so far, uh, Dr. Uh, Baker, have, have any autism patients that have had a confirmed case of aspergillosis like these ones, right, that we're talking about, have, have seen improvements in their aspergillus markers but not in their autism markers. In which markers were, were the important? Yeah, uh, so have, have, have any, any patients uh, or you know, people with autism have had you know, improvements in, in aspergillus markers, but not in their autism symptoms? I would say no. Wow. <laughs> but mind you. I, I, I also, I, I, I would just like to, to add is, even though this is an important factor in autism, I've seen improvements in a whole variety of neurologic disorders, Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, ADHD, children who are just uh, extremely aggressive, children who have seizures. So, so, so this is a, a factor in one disease, but it is by far not the only thing uh, and the, the, the only disease in which the brain is negatively affected by, by mold infection. I should say that I haven't seen any new patients for the last year and the last year, more than a year, uh, because I got to be 84 years old and uh, time to uh, stop seeing new patients. So I, I have not accumulated the uh, numbers given that gap uh, that corresponds almost exactly with my patient, but I, my old patients, I've tried it in and that's the reservoir that I've been 
I've uh, been experienced with, but uh, I have not been out there uh, dishing out uh, Sparnox to everyone, including the postman. Mm -hmm. Now, have have any have any of the children, you know, that that you used to treat with the Sparnox uh, relapsed uh, post treatment? I mean, due due to you know new exposure to mold. No, I would say that that's the remarkable thing in which this index case is is the model once he was better he was better and i expected he would re relapse but now it's been a year and he's he's just great he's just great well um so so besides the improvements in, in autism symptoms uh did the, the, the child in the study of or any others uh, that you have treated have gained have had other gains in their immune system or in their GA symptoms uh, after the treatment. Well, I would say that the, the improvement is across the board. Uh, it, so everything gets better. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, that's the answer. That's oh, okay. I, I thought you were you were going to continue. Yeah. Um, so I, I I I really think that you know all the information you have provided is is super compelling. I mean, I I, I don't think that you know it's I, I I don't remember hearing about anything that is more like a, a clearer uh, you know treatment or protocol for for treating autism. So um, I, um, I I just want to say you know thank you so much for all the information. And is is there is there anything anything else that you would like to share with families today, doctors? Well, uh, I like to talk about the coelacanth, uh, which is a fish that came out of the uh, the Pacific Ocean uh, in 1936 or so. They caught a live coelacanth. Now it was well known at that point that coelacanth was a fossil, and there was no live ones left. But all they caught was one. And they had to believe it. <laughs> okay, so I think that uh, when you have a an experience like this, which is so convincing, it does um, make it very tempting to uh, uh, extrapolate from that experience a, um, a proposition that if it works in this kid, there's going to be others out there. And whom it's going to work, and it's just a question of how how aggressive you want to be in tracking it down. And the the, the good news is that I think we've established that the toxicity is very low and very infrequent to see changes in AST and ALT. So that it's a it's a terrific uh, environment for um, just giving it a try and to see, and again, by going up quickly and then down slowly. Uh, and the, the wonderful thing about it is that you get a response qu quickly. I mean, day by day, uh, it's not as you have to wait a week to see the, the, the sun begin to shine. It really is a, a perfect setup for uh, a therapeutic trial. Would you would you um, would you recommend some some general guidelines for for you know uh, for patients uh, you know as they are conducting treatments like this? I mean, um, I, you, you mentioned just briefly about uh, a potential diet that is that is sugar free and that is gluten free and casein free. Um, what 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 other things would you suggest uh, as a general routine for these kids? Well, I think that getting. Uh, Testing done in Bill Shaw's laboratory is, of course, uh, the way to get some objective data that would tip the tip the, uh, the proposition in the right direction. On the other hand, there, there's there's what I call a thumbs test. You know, you try something for a couple of weeks, and if the, your thumbs go up, that looks <laughs> you've got an answer. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I think that. Uh, lots of people, doctors especially, would like what you call objective data, 
um, that comes out of uh, Bill Shaw's laboratory. But I think that um, beyond that, I, I try to avoid multiple variables at the same time. Uh, in other words, I wouldn't want to start any treatment along with six others, and then you'd have to get down there. If it works, you have to figure it out by, by, uh, by just a little bit of dropping this and then dropping that and so on. But it's, life is not always that is that easy? There's some some other doctor involved who says you you should try taking this and that, and they want to do that at the same time. And thing is, if it's that, if it's if it's good and you, and you get thumbs up, then you have to do uh, you know back out of it and see what's what's good. But I I think you have to be flexible about those things if you're dealing with relatively benign interventions. Yeah. Um, so just uh, as a as a commercial, right? Right now, um, Dr. Shaw is is going to uh, uh, give a webinar um, on this on the same page on March 19th uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So you know, I believe that we're going to walk through all the possible tests that that we can do uh, through the Great Plains Lab. Uh, Dr. Shaw, I don't know if you you have any final words, and if you can also invite people, you know, to your your webinar and, and you know provide some information about what the content of, of the webinar on March 19th. Yeah, so it will just go into uh, great detail, uh, including you know the microscopic pictures of the the fungi in the blood of the uh, children with autism in their parents. It will it will talk about you know the first studies that I did at the Children's Hospital in Kansas City that showed that a high percentage of children with autism had these markers that were characteristic of, uh, of uh, aspergillus. And it would go through the different uh, uh, drug treatments, the different tests that are available, um, and, and the, you know, the, the, uh, the possible uh, different treatments. So it will be very uh, uh, comp comprehensive. And, and if, if there's enough time, you know, I may be able to get some some of the data from the uh, current research study that's going on with a, a hundred families uh, looking at these same factors mm -hmm. the, um, that, that were affecting uh, the child who uh, recovered in, um, in uh, the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we uh, we are actually a little over, and I, I do appreciate your your patience and all the information you have provided. This is this is tremendous. Uh, any final words before we adjourn from you? Yeah, I have a final word. Bill Shaw is a remarkable human being. <laughs> there are lots of people who have been in the laboratory business, and they stick to their laboratory but they don't publish and they don't go out, you know, looking for trouble and try to fix it. But Bill is everywhere and he's just the most brilliant person that has made a, a, a life out of uh, doing this the right way. You know, I was party, I was party to his decision when uh, he parted ways from his previous job and had to think about uh, doing something and I tried to introduce him to different laboratories that might take him on board and he decided he's going to go out and start his own laboratory and do it all himself and by golly he's done a hell of a hell of a job with that and that the laboratory goes way beyond just get your P and then analyze it and send you the report. He's been involved in all kinds of publications and and activities that go way beyond uh, what is uh, uh, considered necessary for a laboratory. So I've been, I treasure my friendship with him. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to voice uh, uh, similar feelings. I, I've known Sidney Baker now for about 25 years. Matter of fact, he was my first critic. I think I uh, we met in a 
uh, one of the Autism Society of America's annual meetings that happened to be in Las Vegas. And I think there were, uh, it was a giant auditorium and I think there were six people uh, in the audience and Dr. Baker was one of those six and he had some very good suggestions on how I should uh, uh, change the format of my uh, of my presentation and be a little bit less uh, uh, scientific and nerdy. And so <laughs> I took his lessons to uh, heart and also my wife insists, you don't have any pictures in your presentation. You And so both of them were very uh, uh, highly um, uh, responsible for any success that uh, I've had, uh, both my wife and uh, and uh, Dr. Br and Dr. Baker is just a wonderful, beautiful human being. Uh, so, thank God for Dr. Baker. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for the opportunity and and for your time today. You know, you're giving hope, uh, both of you, to so many families uh, with these research and and with your work. Uh, and so, you know, I I just. I just want to say on behalf of all these families and on behalf of the autism community again thank you so very much for for everything you do and you know uh, I, i'm really looking forward uh dr show to this presentation on march 19th uh to this webinar uh, and we're we're going to be promoting that uh heavily uh so that you know people can know the the possibilities when it comes to to testing uh their children yes and, and uh, thank you very much enrique for the opportunity to uh, discuss this, I think it was a very, a, a very important uh, a case study. Yes, My pleasure. Okay. this was a, a great idea. My pleasure. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much and see you next time. Okay, okay. bye. Bye.